So um, looking back on 2023, um, you may not remember, it all started with uh, Rihanna, Rihanna's pregnancy reveal early on. Um, that was a Super Bowl halftime show. Um, we don't remember who was in the Super Bowl last year, but, um, or do we? Who won? We don't. Chiefs. Okay. This year, who's it going to be? Cowboy. Cowboy. Chiefs. Okay. We don't know. Um, but Usher will not be able to, you know, to do one up with Rihanna. We're, we're sure on that. But um, we, we hope that's the case. This was the year you, could, you couldn't go anywhere without hearing or seeing Taylor Swift. Am I right? Um, and she became the top story in the NFL this year. Nobody predicted that would happen. But that happened this year. Also, um, I guess it was only her Eras tour. Anybody go to the Eras, any Swifties here? We were at the Eras tour, some of you. Okay. Um, only outdone by the Queen Bee herself. Um, Beyonce. It, I, I read where her, her um, what was it, the Renaissance tour um, added some $5.2 billion to the American economy. So Beyonce out there doing her part. Okay. Um, and then on top of that, I think she took in about $2.1 billion herself. In other royal news, um, King Charles became king, right? He was the 63rd monarch. Charles III became monarch in, in Britain. And Barbie was the number one box office smash hit. I'm still trying to figure that out. I don't know. Because Scream 6 and Cocaine Bear did not fare as well. And this is the culture we live in. Okay. And y'all, the Oxford Dictionary Word of the Year. Riz. Riz. As in charisma. As in like you're attractive to, uh, you know, others. Um, hey, and, you know, continue global um, upheaval in, in 21 where we saw Ukraine uh, offer, you know, this counteroffensive against Russia with little ground gained and a, at a high, high price. And then, of course, the horrifying images and all that we saw as Hamas in this terrorizing, horrific attack on southern Israel. And then that counterattack continues today. As you know, some 21,000 people have been killed. India surpassed China as the most populous nation in the world, um, quietly, I suppose. And AI continues uh, with its promises and perils to come. I think it's going to be a key story in 24. And approaching the new year, I was reading that Americans are most concerned about the high cost of living, right? The high cost of everything, uh, immigration, and then uh, thirdly, our politicians' inability to get much of anything done. And we're heading into an election year. So that doesn't fare well either, it seems. Mark Sayers, who's an, an astute Christian uh, commentator, he says that we're still in the age of anxiety. Now we see the politics, the, he calls it the um, politics of protest. But now we're hearing the drums of war. And we're not sure what 24 holds. None of us are. Some of us are eager to get on to 24 because 23 was a rough year. And can I just say it? I, I'm sitting down here with MC Peterson. Some of y'all know Pike Peterson, whom we have been praying for, a uh, teenager in our student ministry. Um, he, was, he was diagnosed with acute myeloid like leukemia, found a match in his brother. He has had now um, transfusions and such, and he is home today. We hope forever. Praise be to God. He is home. He's gone home, and we're trusting in the Lord, that he is healed and his life, 24 is going to be a better year for not only the Peterson family, but for all of us. And we praise God for how he's answered our prayers and how he's used you as a church family to help come alongside them and, and literally giving life, giving blood to bring life. But here's what I know, all that to say, as we move forward, those of us who follow Jesus, the way that we'll press into whatever comes our way this year, and we don't know, we know there will be highs and lows this coming year, but the thing that will sustain us as resilient disciples who prevail against all things, who are overcomers in whatever comes our way will be this. It will be gratitude and thanksgiving. What I want to talk about today is no small thing. And to be clear, gratitude is an attitude. 
It is a practice. It is an expression. And it is a spiritual discipline that can change every single day of your life in 24. What we're talking about today is a big, big deal. You can approach every single day with thanksgiving and gratitude because as a believer, we, we should be more than anyone on the planet. People, every day, all of life is one big hallelujah back to God. Hallelujah. Praise be to God every single day. Amen? Every day we can wake up and we can say, this is a wonderful day because I have never seen this one before. God is about to do a new thing. And if we live this way, we become this joyful presence into the lives of everyone around us. And we should live like this. Every single day should be an act of worship. So let's talk about it. The prayer of thanksgiving. We've been talking about prayers throughout this, this uh, season. And um, we've already talked kids. We've already said church. I don't know if you, you caught that. Um, but here's the challenge. Another word. Um, that I bring to you today is that we're going to talk about how we expand our prayer life even more. We've talked about expectant prayer. We've talked about listening prayer. We've talked about prayers of celebration. We're trying to expand our prayer lives. And today we're talking about the prayer of thanksgiving. So I want you to turn to Luke chapter two. All right. We're going to look at a passage. One of my favorite. I love this story. A little known, little, you know, often overlooked story that we find in the Christmas story. So everybody turn to Luke chapter two. We're in the word of God, verse 25. We're going to walk through it together. What we're going to see here is this. We can thank God. I want you to think about whatever you're going through, but I want you to think about what are you waiting for in your life? That'll help you think about what are you waiting for? Because we can thank God while we wait. Watch this. We can thank God while we watch for him and we can thank God while we welcome him into our lives every day. In verse 21, Jesus is circumcised. Okay, this is a transition from the Christmas story we read on Christmas Eve. And now the time for purification has been fulfilled. This is for Mary uh, primarily. We find this in Leviticus that she now 40 days after uh, purification, she comes to the temple. um, And this is a uh, part of the law. So they're keeping the law following all that's supposed to be done. Jesus is about 40 days old here. All right. And so they come here and watch this, a little nuanced story that gives us some insight. They don't uh, offer a lamb as a sacrifice because what the law permitted was if you could not afford a lamb, if you were poor, didn't have a whole lot of money, you could offer two turtle doves, by the way, um, or two pigeons. Um, They were evidently a a very poor, uh, you know, almost Bedouin couple on, on, on the move. Then... They meet, here it is, Simeon and Anna, two senior saints who remind us that Christmas is not just for kids. Christmas is for all of us. And we've already met a couple of senior adults in Luke's story. Anybody remember who they were early on? Elizabeth and Zechariah. Yes, good. So let's talk about the prayer of Thanksgiving. First thing I want you to see, kids, write this down. You have a place to write it down. We thank God while we wait for him. His timing in other words, is not like ours. God has been said, he's never late. He, he, he's seldom early, but he is always right on time. I can tell you that my daughter Whitney right now is thinking God is late because she is due any minute, y'all, right now. Whitney is due with our, another granddaughter. And so if Stacy gets up any minute and heads out, You'll know that we're going to connect later. We, you know, probably grabbing Henry or something. We got to do something. But she is great with child and we are celebrating already. But what are you waiting for these days? Look at this in verse 25. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout. Okay, underline those two words. Waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So Simeon is described in the same way that Zechariah and Elizabeth and Joseph are described. And it tells us everything we need to know about him. To be described as as devout, as righteous, or just tells us that he was following God's commands. He was all in. He believed God's word. He knew God's word, and he was waiting for the consolation. We see that word in some of our hymns at Christmas time. Comfort. 
of Israel. Think about that. The Messiah was to come. The Prince of Peace would bring comfort to his people, and he does so still today. What we know about Simeon is when he was young, 63 BC, Pompey, uh, the Romans, came in and, and took over Jerusalem and surrounding area. They and, and killed many people, um, perhaps some of Simeon's own family. And so they put up this, this client king by the name of King Herod the Great. And so Simeon lived in this oppressive state um, culturally and politically. He was longing, along with everybody, all his life, longing for a real leader to come, longing for the promised Messiah. So he's living this way. And, and what he does here, you're going to see that he lived with thanksgiving and gratitude in the waiting. Friends, it's possible in the waiting to worship God and to thank him. Look, see, it's, it's this. Listen to this. As you trust in the promises of God, he, he then, trust creates expectation. And expectation, active, as we'll see, expectation creates thanksgiving. And we live with great joy. So here's what, I, what are you waiting for? I want to ask you, what are you waiting for these days? Because some of us are wait, waiting on some real things to happen. Maybe it's a relationship to be mended. Maybe it's that job to finally come. Maybe it's an illness. Maybe it's something that you're longing for. But here, here's what you might be asking already. If you, sh- you know, Simeon's waiting on something that was very explicit. He didn't know when the Messiah would come, but he's waiting. The question that we ask, I think, is, am I waiting for something that God has actually promised me? This is where our faith and, and, and theology and practice collide. Uh, am I actually waiting on something? Because there's so many things we're waiting for, and we're thinking, but they're not bad things, they're good things. And we're waiting on them to happen, but they're not explicit in Scripture. God didn't promise me this. Some of you have been through times of grief or illness. Um, You've been through some hard times, and and you've had people come alongside. You go well-intentioned people who say, oh, you're going to be okay. I'm praying. You're going to be healed. I know that's going to happen. And, you know, truthfully, you're like, you don't know that. You don't know that. I know this is going to happen for you. I'm praying for God to move. And you're like, you don't know that. See, what we, what we need to look at today is, let's look at what we do know up against maybe what we're hoping for, right? And God does want to bless his children with good things. So let's, let's talk about this because the waiting on certain things in our lives as we, as we follow him can be debilitating and it can be crushing at times. And it can be summed up in a verse. Proverbs 13, 12 says this, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But longing fulfilled is a tree of life. It's like unrelenting disappointment can just beat us down. But that one movement of God, a breakthrough, can bring life to us. It's what we hope for. Waiting can be debilitating. It can be wearisome, and we can lose our faith at times. But don't miss this. Simeon had been praying for something that was promised explicitly by God. We don't exactly know how or when he learned this. Um, This is where my mind goes in my studies. Um, I thought, how cool would it be to know you're not going to die until you see the Messiah? (laughs) I wonder in his later years, like, was he ever ill or sick? Somebody goes, bro, you're going to die. He goes, no, I'm not dying. I ain't dying. I ain't seen the Messiah. Like, did he become a risk taker? You know, I've wondered about that. Are you going to kill yourself? No, I'm not. I'm not. I'd seen the Messiah. He's jumping out of airplanes, if it were the case. Um, he's just doing all kinds of stuff. But no, I say that. We know this. It did give him strength and courage to press on every day because that's what promises do. They help us to keep moving. But many of us are waiting for something and there's no direct scripture attached to it. So watch this. Here's what could happen. And we all do this in varying degrees. We can turn towards that thing that we want. It's not good or bad either way, or it's a great thing. We want this, Lord. Please, please, please. But it can get us off of, can be obsessed with that thing instead of the things he's already promised us. Instead of what he's already said in his word. You see, we can take our focus off of him and focus on what we do not have can be our obsession. That's the opposite of joy. That's the opposite of peace. That's discontent, not contentment and joy. And yet it's something we wrestle with. We've talked about this in this series, but I'm going to say it again. As we've talked about prayer, there's no such thing as unanswered prayer. We need to remove that from our vocabulary. 
Because, and this is hard, but it comes to play here. Let's be real. No is a full sentence. And no can be an answer to our prayers. And we don't want that. That challenges our faith, right? Wait is not no. And, and so if, if the timing's not right, or how about this? If my motivation's not right, if I'm not right, my request is not right, God, by his sovereign grace, will not answer our prayers for our good and to his glory. If the timing's right, request is right, motivation is right, if it lines up with his will for us, he will answer in the affirmative 100% of the time. He answers all of our prayers. And he has us in his mind and he loves us. But this is coupled with the fact that he does want to bless his children with good things, right? And so there's this mystery here, but I think you're going to see how we can trust him in the waiting because Simeon knew the scriptures. He knew of Isaiah's prophecies towards the coming Messiah. And he knew Isaiah 40, 31, that says those who wait, anybody on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not be faint. We can press on with each and every day because as we wait on the Lord, he gives us strength. He gives us the presence. He is our comfort and strength. Friends, listen, don't miss this. The promise is him. The promise is him. His presence with us. Gratitude brings perseverance because we trust in him. See, most of you know when tragedy strikes and those of us who are older here know this better than most of you. But when you experience loss, or if you've been in our grief share program, or if you have lost a loved one or a spouse, a child, you know this. When tragedy strikes, it will test your faith and it will challenge you to see where you place your trust. When you have something that you love stripped away from you, it will reveal where you place your trust. But watch this. Disappointment over time in the waiting can do the same thing. See, if grief is a stripping away of something you love, testing where, what is your ultimate love, waiting can do the same thing. It can be a grief of that which has not yet happened, not maybe something that has happened. And so we have a time where we find ourselves in the furnace. And, and it's not God being, being angry with you or unloving, but it comes to us. Waiting forces us to ask, where or who is my ultimate hope? In life, do I want, how about this? Do I want God more than what I'm asking for? Or do I want him as a means towards the thing? And if he doesn't come through for me, then I, I'm out. And we're seeing a lot of that in our culture today. God didn't match up with who I thought he was. We call it deconstruction, de-churching, deconversion. We're seeing a lot of that in our day because we've got to focus on who God is and what he's already done for us. Because this in the waiting, this is a profound question, right at the heart of worship. Do I worship God because of who he is or because of what I might get from him? The latter is a, is a prosperity gospel. That's not the gospel in the Bible. The gospel of the Bible is I will go through suffering and challenges in this life, but I get him and he's enough for me. But friends, let's be honest, that's really hard. That's hard for all of us. Simeon lived Waiting on a leader, a real leader to come. Waiting on the Christ, the Messiah, to come in the midst of cultural, political oppression. And Simeon had placed all of his hope on the coming Messiah. We can place our hope there too. Because he's already come. He is all, we know a lot more than Simeon knew. Where do you place your trust? This is a big question today. If it is in God, you can thank him every single day and wait for him. And yes, thank him for what he's already accomplished in your life. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. The old hymn says. So in verse 20, 27, watch this. But the next point I want you to see. We thank God while we watch for him. Kids, write that down. We thank God while we watch for him. Simeon didn't just wait on the Lord. He actively waited on the Lord. And this is what I want you to see here today. Verse 27. And he came in the spirit into the temple. That's another word, I think. Check it off. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus 
to do for him according to the custom of the law. He took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, you know, imagine this moment. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Now imagine this moment. It's happened in our sanctuary. It's happened in this room many times. It'll happen in our Espanol uh, gathering that takes place after this service. We'll have a parent-child dedication. It's, how about this? If this were to happen in our context, old man comes up. Old man comes, can I, can I see this baby? Can I have this baby for a minute? Now our security guys be on the watch. They're like, what's going on? <laughs> and what if he were to then just hold this baby and just start talking about how amazing this baby is, you know? And that, that's an incredible moment, but he is waiting and watching. And here's what's so sweet about this. I discovered this week in my studies, the first word in the Greek is, the, is, is this word, the first word in the Greek. Now, 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 I'm done. That's it. I've seen, I've seen the Messiah. My life is, is fulfilled. I can go home now. I'm tired. I'm weary. But now, now I can go home. I just think that's such a beautiful moment. He says, Lord, let your servant depart in peace because the day had come. The day had come that he'd been waiting for. So how can you watch for him? Friends, let's get real practical here. Not passively. But actively, Simeon, he was there in the temple. I don't know if he was there every day. I don't know if he was there like, is that the one? Is that, you may, this might be the one. The Holy Spirit, it said three times, he's attached to the Holy Spirit in this story. The Holy Spirit was guiding him. Holy Spirit was in his life. And he was being led by the Spirit. And so here's the challenge for us. For all of us here, how can you watch for him? How can you wait for him? We can watch like Simeon was watching. We can abide in him. We can dwell in his word. And here's the challenge I have for you. While you're setting goals, and I hope you do, set goals physically, vocationally, relationally, uh, spiritually. Set goals in those areas. But focus not so much on goals. Focus on habits. Remember this. Habits, will how, is, that's how you'll become who you need to become. Because that's really what life's about. Not accomplishing these things, but becoming the person that God's called you to be. And one of the things you can do, habits involve coming to worship every single week. Whatever venue, wherever you go, or if you're from another place and have another church, go every week to be in place. How about this? Here's a promise you need to make to the Lord right now. I'm going to be in church every single Sunday, every Sunday throughout 24. That's what I'm going to do. There's a habit that will change your life over time. I promise you. You might think, well, I expect that to hear from my pastor. But let me, let me tell you, it'll change your life. As will being in the word of God every single day. We say it often. If we believe God speaks through his word, you need to be in our dwell reading together. As a church family, we're moving together. And we're going to be talking about the promises of God coming next week. We're reading in Genesis, starting with Genesis 1 tomorrow. Be in the word every day because here it is. Oh, listen. It puts you in position to hear from God. Simeon was in the temple. Why? That was the very location of the presence of God in his time. And then he's holding Jesus, the exact location of the presence of God in the person of Jesus, the Messiah. You want to hear from God? You want 24 to be the greatest year you've ever known? Put yourself in position to hear from him. Being in his word, praying, as we've talked about so much this year. But can, see, God can do anything. So you're, you're, you're asking the question, if you're tracking with me here, why do you have to wait on certain things? Well, we've talked about some of that. But here's the thing I want you to take home with you. Somebody you need to write this down. Often what God does in us while we wait is more important than what we're waiting for. I'm guessing the Peterson family can tell us a little bit about that, Right? What God does in us while we're waiting is greater often, almost always, than what we're waiting for. Because he's drawing us to himself. 
And sometimes, sometimes y'all, life just stinks. And I know I've been through some things. Stacey and I have been through some things. We just go, meh. That was just horrible, is all that was. Where was God? And yet he is at work in us, even in ways we can't see. Another way to frame this is, is are you, while you're waiting, longing for this thing, asking God for this or that, are you also at the same time asking, Lord, do your work in me while I'm waiting? Do what you want to do, because I don't want to waste this. It's too painful. I want you to do the work in me. I want to be conformed into your image. Another way to frame that question, is being conformed into his image the most important thing in your life? Or is it the thing? Or the next thing? Or the next thing? Because too often when we go through hard times, in church, let's do this well, often we Romans 8, 28 people. You know what I'm talking about? We roam, you know, all things, it's going to work out for the good, those who love God. Is it que sera, sera? Whatever will be, will be. That's not the gospel. That's not scripture. Romans 8.28 is followed by Romans 8.29. It says, according to his purpose, God's going to work out all things. What's his purpose? Verse 29. For us to be conformed into the image of Christ. That's his purpose. That's why we know we can make it through all things because he's conforming us into his image if we're partnering with him. Aligning our lives up with him. Could it be that prayer is more, uh, more about aligning our will up to him than is asking him for stuff? Because if we align ourselves up with his word, we pray in Jesus' name. Why do we pray in Jesus' name? According to his character. According to who he is. Lord, in your name we pray. We pray longing for your will to be done. As we pray according to his will. Again, he answers our prayers 100% of the time. That's what it means to knock and it'll be open. Ask. And he will respond to you. He'll give to you. So let's, let's close with this. We thank him. We can thank him while we're waiting. We can thank him while we watch for him. And we can thank him while we welcome him. Simeon literally welcomed him into his arms. But we know more than what Simeon knows, right? He is with us. And we can welcome him into our lives every single day. Wake up every day in the coming year and say, Lord, I welcome you into my life in every aspect of my life today. And I want to be in your presence right now. I want to live in your presence and I'm going to follow you all day long. Do it every day, one day at a time. 24 will be the greatest year you've ever known. Look at verse 33. And his father and his mother marveled at this crazy parental dedication because they're like, what's happening? But Mary, did you know? Mary knew. Can I just end? It, she knew. She knew a lot. She knew. And his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold this child. I love that. He's longing for the salvation of Israel to come. And he just said, behold this child is appointed for the fall and rising. Listen to this. Of many in Israel. And for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul. Also, he says to Mary, his mother, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. He's saying, gang, listen to this. He's saying, Mary, your little baby, he will grow up and people, he will be the most loved and most hated person in the world throughout history, and he still is today. Because the the cross is the demarcation point. Talk about God in our culture all you want to. Talk about Jesus. Talk about what Christ has done for us. Talk about how he's come to rescue us from our sin, and he alone is the only way to salvation. That's a divining line. That reveals the heart of people. Will you trust in him or trust in yourself? That's the dividing line. Will you trust in his justification for us or you're in your own self-justification? Will you seek salvation in your own works or will you trust in him for the perfect work he's already accomplished for you? That's the demarcation point. The gospel divides and it's why Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. I mean, in that context, I came to bring a sword. 
Meaning, not wars, not, not fighting, but instead, I came to, to, to mark and reveal the hearts of people, humble before me or prideful, turning away from me. And Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. Look at this. I want us to close, but I can't close without looking at this prophetess Anna. All right, look at verse 36, and then we'll wrap it up. There was a prophetess Anna. Kids, there's the word. Write it down. Check it. The, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. And then as a widow until she was 84 years old. She was 84, kids. She was an octogenarian. That's another word. She was old. She did not depart from the temple. Did not depart from the temple. Worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks. There it is to God and to speak to, of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And for those who claim women can't preach, behold Anna in the temple, praising God and worshiping him. Anna reminds me of so many women that I know in my life who've impacted my life through the years. Amen? Amen. Women who've invested in me, in your life. She reminds me of the godly women that I know in our church who are here all the time serving. Quietly serving, perhaps, or teaching, guiding, and leading. She is a godly woman of honor. And a woman that we, the kind of women we honor on here. I just imagine her gracing the temple, bringing joy to everybody in the place. And she was always there. So let's summarize this story. This is a story of waiting. We can worship him. We can thank him while we wait. We can thank him while we watch for him to move in our lives because he's up to the next thing, gang. You can always watch for him with expectant joy, which brings strength and courage in the day, days to come. And you can thank him as you welcome him into every aspect of your life. But as we close, let's be honest, some of us still, Lord, how long? How long? Which is still a legitimate prayer. But I, I want you to notice this. How long is a prayer of faith? If you're crying out, Lord, how long? How long until you do this thing? How long am I have to wait? How long is my heart going to be crushed? If that's your prayer, that is a prayer of faith. Don't miss this. You may be angry about the waiting. You may be crying out to God, but you're still saying, Lord, how long? Because two, a couple things. You know how long. I don't, but you do. Or how about this? How long, Lord? Because I know it's not supposed to be like this. How long? How long is to say, God, I know you're at work in my life because behind the backdrop or, or, or the backdrop behind this story of waiting and your waiting is the story of all of creation waiting on God. But there's coming a day, friend, when all that he hates and he hates sin, he hates death, he hates what sin does to us and he will eliminate everything that he hates. And that day is coming. It's why we can join Paul when he said in Romans 8, 22, for we know, everybody say, we know, we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, we have the first fruits of the spirit upon us. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly. Y'all listen. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly, trusting God that he has our best intentions in mind as adopted sons and daughters, the redemption of our bodies. He's making all things new. Amen. It's coming, friends. He is renewing all things and he's called us to join him in it. We, we can wait for him and give thanks to him like Simeon and Anna we can proclaim, especially Anna, we can proclaim his goodness and his greatness, even in the waiting. 
And we can bring an, an, an expectant joy to every person around us. Even, how about this? And especially when they know when we're going through hard times. If they know we're waiting or wow, that's not going to come in your lifetime. Some people with certain debilitations or handicaps or challenges, it's not going to happen. It's coming. And we can wait eagerly and worship him. And in this coming year, friends, do what a friend group of mine, we are committed to doing this, living eulogies to one another. Don't wait till people you love die to offer praise and thanksgiving for their lives, in your life, and their influence in your life. Like Simeon and Anna, you can place your trust in the Lord because he will come through for you. And the late, great Tim Keller, drawing from a scene in The Lord of the Rings, he said this, everything sad is going to come untrue, and it will somehow be greater for having once been broken and lost. God redeems everything that he allows. And he's redeeming all things in your life for your good and for his purpose. So here's the, here's the question. What habits will you form in your life that will put you in position to hear from God? Starting today, you're here, praise God. Be here next week. Be in the word tomorrow. Block off a time in 24 hours of your day to spend a moment in his word. Read the scriptures with us. And my final challenge is this. Do not die until you can join Simeon and say, I found him. I've seen him. Do not die before you invite Christ into your heart to forgive you of your sin, and to rescue you from yourself, that you might live with him now and forever. Because friends, listen, in a crowd this size, 2024 might be the second number on your tombstone. And I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm saying today is the day of salvation for you to receive Christ right now. And so what I want us to do, I want us to bow our heads right now. Close our eyes, and I'm going to ask our team to come up because they're going to be leading us. We're going to end our time with doxology together. But I want you to just close your eyes and, um, and just follow along with me. Because if you're here today, friends, this is a holy moment. This is a holy moment right now. That on this day, it's such a key day as we move to a new year. We, we just pray that we've been praying salvation would come today. And friend, if you don't know Christ, today is your day. Today is the day of salvation. So I ask you, if you don't know that you know for sure, you can settle that today before you go into another year of life, another minute without him. Just say, Lord, come into my life. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. For seeking to live life on my own, try to justify myself, validate my existence. And I'm tired. I am weary. Friends, the holy commands of God are crushing. So he sent Jesus to be our substitute. And he did it for you. So I say, Lord, thank you. Thank you. Coming in my heart. Coming in my life. I give you my life. I don't want to go another day without seeing you. Without welcoming you into my arms, my heart, as you have already welcomed me into your arms. I run to you. To live for you. Lord, you alone are worthy of our worship. And though this life is a mystery often, and it is loaded with heartache and pain and waiting. But you're with us in the waiting. And you've already said who we are. We are your beloved children. And we can give you praise. We can stand in the midst of opposition, of disappointment and pain, and even suffering. And we can say, you're good. And we love you. 
Give us more faith, Lord. We believe. Help us with our unbelief that we'll hold on and trust you. Lord, may we find your presence as we place ourselves in position to hear from you and to love you and to serve you all the days of our lives. We give you praise. Even now, we give you our lives in Jesus' name. Amen.